James, if you can confirm for me. Yes, we are live on Facebook. Excellent. Okay, we will get this show on the road then. We have 52 people in our attendance list, so that's great. Welcome everybody to the New Hampshire Liquor and Wine Outlets. Uh, we have a wonderful night planned tonight. With us, we will have um, E.T. Tukeski, which is from Jack Daniels. So thank you so much for joining us, E.T. Um, also, starring in tonight's roles will be Mark Roy from the History of Liquor and Wine Outlets. He's our specialist on the spirit side, and I'm sure you've seen plenty of him. So thank you, Mark, for joining us. Um, just a quick reminder to everybody, if you register for our events through Eventbrite, you will be offered any coupons that are related to the events. And this evening, there was a $5 coupon. So make sure that in the future you register through Eventbrite. You can also watch us on Facebook. And during tonight's episode, if you want to comment in the chat box or leave questions and answers either on Zoom or on Facebook, we'll be sure to field those questions and get them on over to ET or Mark. Um, and with that, ET, we will throw it on over to you to start the program. All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, good to be sort of back in New Hampshire. Um, happy holidays, everyone. The... Uh, you know, before we start, I just wanted to say that, you know, with all the stuff going on in the world, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be here and I hope we can have some fun tonight because I think we all need it. So let's enjoy. And if you have any questions at all, please let me know. If, if I've never met you before, I haven't done an event with you. I'm living out in LA now, originally from Philly. Prior to working at Jack Daniels as the US ambassador, I worked behind bars for a little over two decades. So bartending, owning bars, running bars, all that good stuff and and jack was always you know my spirit of choice and i believe it probably came from my parents uh through music my dad was all sinatra all the time and my mother pretty much read me in utero with rock and roll and when i got old enough i realized that both those worlds meet at jack daniels so that's probably why i reached for a bottle when i was 21 and but you know, when you become an adult and you start drinking on your own, you can pick whatever you want. And it was really what was in the bottle that kept me coming back for more. So, you know, I was just working behind a bar and I, I met some of the local Jack team. And one day they knew how much I loved it. And they asked me to host a Jack dinner. And I said, sure, you know, greatest gig ever. And that just evolved into another job, into another job. And a couple of years later, I became full-time for Jack and never looked back. So we have a lot of fun planned for everyone. We have a lot of biscuit to taste and some good history to learn about Jack himself and the brand and you know what's inside the bottle, but also how Jack lives outside the bottle because over 150 years, Jack's been out there. So there's a lot of stories and there's a lot of history and there's a lot of pop culture and there's just a lot of cool stuff that I hope we can get to today. So without further ado, there's really no way to talk about Jack without talking about Jack and you know, Jack Daniel was a real person. It wasn't made up for marketing. It, it was, he was a real, real guy. He born around 1850, you know, records weren't as good as they are today. So we assume around 1850, that's what's on his gravestone. Um, been some discrepancy, but it's a nice round number. And he was one of 10 children and his mom passed away soon after he was born and his father remarried. They had three more kids and then his father passed away. So now he was living with his stepmom and 12 siblings and wasn't digging it. And like a lot of kids didn't have the greatest relationship with his stepmom. So, you know, it sounds crazy in today's world, Jack left home at about eight years old and a few miles down the road was a guy named Dan Call. Now Dan Call owned a farm, he owned the general store and he was trying to become a Lutheran minister. And at the time he only had two daughters, which wasn't great for housework and having help in the store. So he was happy to bring little Jack in to help out with some of the chores. So Jack lived there and for you know, most of his uh, childhood. So after a couple of years of living there, Jack discovered another passion of uh, the future Reverend Dan Call, which was making whiskey. And when Jack saw the operation, he was enamored by it and fell in love with the whole whiskey making process. So when when Jack discovered whiskey, this was pre-emancipation. So there were some enslaved men living and working on the Dan Call farm. And one of those guys was named Nearest Green. And Nearest Green was reputed to be one of the best whiskey makers in the area. So Dan entrusted Nearest 
to train young Jack Daniel how to make whiskey. And this went on for years. They, they became really good friends and Nearest taught Jack what he knew and Jack just kept learning and loving whiskey more and more. And unfortunately for the Reverend Dan Call, he came home from, uh, I don't know, I'm going to make this up a little bit because I don't know where he was coming from, but he did come home and his wife was sitting on the front porch and she basically said, you know, we need to have a talk. And I'm sure all the husbands out there in the world know that you never want your wife saying we need to have a talk. It's never good news. And basically she said that her and the other women at church were a little upset that Dan Call, this man of God, this spiritual leader for the community made whiskey. So she said, choose the spirit, basically, you know, whiskey or God. And Dan Call chose happy wife, happy life, and sold his still to probably about 13-year-old Jack Daniel for 25 bucks on credit. And the first thing Jack did was hire Nearest Green. This is after uh, emancipation at this point. So Jack hired Nearest and was his first employee. And we like to say, you know, Nearest Green was the first master distiller of Jack Daniels. And this relationship kept bonding and they kept doing well with the whiskey and Jack grew the brand. And eventually he discovered a cave a few miles away from Dan Call's farm in Lynchburg. And that cave had this gorgeous, lovely uh, water that was perfect for making whiskey. And the reason it was perfect, uh, in Tennessee and Kentucky, a lot of the land is built on limestone shelves. And limestone is a natural filter for iron and you have to have iron-free water to make whiskey. So Jack discovered this gorgeous cave of iron-free water to make his whiskey and he moved to still in the cave and asked Nearest to come work for him again. And Nearest was 70 at this point. So he felt like, you know, I did my time making whiskey. I made a lot of money. And Dan Call had just got home from uh, the Civil War and he was injured. So Nearest decided to live out his golden years on the farm. But he did send his two sons along with Jack. And they were his first two hires at the new distillery in Lynchburg. Now that cave today is where all the water comes that makes Jack Daniels still 100, you know, since 1881 around um, that water that comes from that cave. It's about a two mile aquifer underground and all the water that makes Jack Daniels comes from that cave to this day, which is crazy. And it's, it's if you've ever been to Jack, what's lovely and Sean, if you have those pictures, a picture of Jack and there's a picture of the cave, um, you know, if you've ever been there, that cave, no matter what the temperature is outside world, it's 56 degrees inside the cave. It's just optimal water for making whiskey. So Jack really did kind of hit pay dirt when he found that cave. And one thing that near it, which really is the cornerstone of, of what Tennessee, um, that's a statue of Jack in front of the cave, um, snowing for the holidays. And then the next picture is the actual cave itself where all that water comes from. But for, for those of you that, do a lot of these tastings and and pay attention to spirits you know bourbon is the american spirit and jack daniels is tennessee whiskey they're like kissing cousins they're very very close but there is a big difference and this is what nearest green taught to jack and this is what nearest green taught himself which is a process called charcoal mellowing and charcoal mellowing is really the distinct characteristics there's the cave that makes Daniels unique versus bourbon. Um, the, the process itself, I, it's really difficult to find out where it came from, but we, we suspect a lot of the slaves that were brought over to America already had a lot of distilling um, wherewithal because in, in Africa, there's a lot of uh, brandies being made, and a lot of liqueurs being made. So they knew a lot about distilling alcohol and charcoal mellowing was a process that they brought with them, we suspect. And so it was no surprise that Nearest Green knew about charcoal mellowing. Today, if you look at the legal definition, Tennessee whiskey is straight bourbon made in Tennessee that touches charcoal. Now that's that's the key, touching charcoal. Um, it really could literally be, we could take in a swimming pool and hermetically seal it and drop one briquette of charcoal in that swimming pool of new make whiskey and that would be technically legally Tennessee whiskey. That briquette would do absolutely nothing. At Jack Daniels, as you saw, we do 10 feet of sugar maple charcoal. We make it uh, by hand at the distillery. There's two guys, Darren and Tracy. That's their sole job all year long is to make charcoal. 
and they burn it on site, crush it down, pack it 10 feet tall into vats and literally drop by drop, Jack Daniels um, hits the top of that charcoal, takes about three to four days to get to the bottom. And at that point, when we put it in new oak barrels, we're making Tennessee whiskey. And we'll get to in a moment what that charcoal actually does. But in order to really uh, discover what charcoal does and what Jack Daniel is, and since I'm showing you these lovely bottles, I think we should start drinking. So if, if whoever is playing along at home and, and doing the tasting with us, we're going to start with Gentleman Jack. And if you've never had Gentleman Jack, it's a one of a kind whiskey. Gentleman Jack is the only uh, Tennessee whiskey, bourbon whiskey of its kind in the world. And by that, it's double mellowed. So we talked about charcoal mellowing for Jack. Gentleman Jack is double mellowed, and that's why we're going to start there. So what we do is we basically make bourbon. We put it through 10 feet of sugar maple charcoal. It goes in a new charred oak barrel, and it comes out. At that point, Jack Daniels, old number seven, goes into the bottle. Gentleman Jack goes through about three feet more of charcoal to just kind of round those edges and pull some of that bitterness off the oak. And then it goes into the bottle. So I know you guys have done tons, I think 90 days of tasting. So if you've heard this before, you know, ignore me. If you haven't heard it, I'll give you a couple of little tricks of tasting. So wine tastings, you know, it's really nice to swirl the wine, put your nose in the glass and take a big whiff. Wine is much lower proof than whiskey. And we're going to start at 80 proof and go up. So putting your nose in the glass and taking a big whiff, those alcohol vapors could disrupt your palate. So I would suggest putting your nose in the glass and then breathing in through your mouth. And that's going to touch all the same receptors. You're going to get all the same experience, but you won't mess up your palate. And since we're not live, we can't really have a quick interaction, but you do get that, that traditional Jack vanilla off the nose. You get a nice sweetness um, on Gentleman Jack. And there's really nothing offensive because of that double mellowing process. Now, let's take a little bit of sip. Don't worry about how it tastes the first time. Just let it coat your mouth. Maybe you just had dinner and, and you're, you're got all these flavors going on. So just take a little sip, swirl it around, and then take a second sip. And that's where you should really think about what it tastes like. Nice. Now, I am not a, a medical professional, so I consulted one to really find out how Jack Daniels and how whiskey affects your palate. And this doctor friend of mine made me a chart that I'm going to share with you so we can really understand how whiskey affects the palate. So here's my official chart for my physician, Dr. Rock and Roll. And as you can see at the very tip of the tongue, that's where the sweet notes hit your palate. Okay. And from sweet, we get into a little bit of salty, which won't really affect anything we're doing now. Then that mid palate is where you're going to pick up some of those sour notes. And at the back of your uh, palate, that's where you're going to get those oak or bitter notes. And this is officially a hundred percent scientific and medical from my good friend, Dr. Rock and Roll. Now, how does that affect Jack Daniels? So gentlemen, Jack, <laughs> if, when it hits the tip of your tongue, you're getting all those sweet vanilla caramel notes right away. There's a little bit in your mid palate. And then when it hits the back of your palate, it disappears. And it was meant to do that. It was meant to be very approachable and very un, you know, I guess for lack of a better word, big whiskey. That was the reason Gentleman Jack came out. When Gentleman Jack was launched in the eighties, that was when vodka really started dominating the world and also when scotch was considered the only, uh, you know, whiskey of any kind of class. And I don't know how they, they, they pulled that off, but they did nothing against scotch, but they really put a hurt on American whiskey's reputation for a couple of years. And our distillers felt like if people wanted something more subtle, more approachable, a little bit less traditional American whiskey, let's try it. And the way they figured it out was by double mellowing this whiskey. So now it's about the eighth time I brought up charcoal. So let's, let's find out what charcoal actually does to whiskey. So the easiest way to describe it is a, a water filter. If any of you have ever had or seen a Brita filter or anything like that, tap water comes in the top of the filter and it goes through charcoal. 
and that charcoal pulls out impurities in the water, it pulls out vitamins and minerals and, and some sediment that you don't want. And in the, in the bottom basin is pure, clean, delicious drinking water. And charcoal does the same thing to whiskey. It pulls things out, it adds nothing. So for us, it's pulling out, you know, oil, uh, corn oils, corn aromas, corn flavors. It's pulling out fatty acids. It's really muting some of those bitter notes and oak notes you're gonna get from the wood. And even corn, which is traditionally a sweeter grain, does have some bitter notes, which that charcoal mellowing is going to tone down. And what that does, it leaves space for other flavors to shine. It doesn't add flavor, but that tastes so much different than traditional bourbon because of how we charcoal mellow. And, you know, I, I pray our distillers aren't watching this, but think about a Snickers bar, all right? Delicious, yummy, take a bite into a Snickers bar. Now, by adding nothing to a Snickers bar, let's take something out. Let's take out the peanuts. So we're removing the peanuts and now what do we have? We have a Milky Way. Tastes completely different from a Snickers bar without adding a flavor. All we're doing is removing the peanuts and by removing that one flavor note, all the other flavors, the nougat and the caramel shine differently. And that's kind of what charcoal mellowing does. It's removing some flavors and allowing other flavors to shine. So those notes you get in Jack Daniels, especially Gentleman Jack, we just tried some of those vanilla, some of those sweeter caramel notes, they really shine, especially in Gentleman Jack. And, you know, that mellowing process really helps, especially on that second pass, that three feet after it goes in the, the barrel. Now it's pulling out some of the bitter oak notes we're getting from aging. And that's why at the back of your throat, you get nothing. And it was made like next time you're at a party and one of your friends leaves, you can say he made a gentleman's exit, right? So he came in strong and then just disappeared at the back of your throat. And now we're not any one culture like we like to do. And we say these, these quick exits, so we can just call it a gentleman's exit. And to really, you know, exemplify how mild and how approachable and how subtle Gentleman Jack is, the best thing to do is, is go all the way over to single barrel and we'll make that our next tasting. And the reason I want to do that is because about a, uh, a decade after Gentleman Jack came out, the world started paying attention to American whiskey again. And they wanted these big, bold flavors. They said, hey, this is our spirit. Let's discover it. Let's enjoy it. Let's look at it. So we came out with our, our first single barrel whiskeys. Now, the biggest difference in single barrel whiskey versus Jack Daniels is in the name. It comes from a single barrel. And that's really important when you think about the production of whiskey, because traditionally, all you want to do is have consistency of flavor and color. That's our goal. We want every bottle of Jack to be a bottle of Jack. And we go painstakingly measures to make sure the yeast that we propagate, the barrels that we make, the, the way we uh, smash our grains, the water that we're using, all the charcoal, all is so consistent that we're putting out this great, delicious, consistent product over and over. And then all of a sudden here comes single barrel. And we decided to throw that out the window and have fun with the unique flavors whiskeys can get from that barrel. So when you're only using one barrel to create all that flavor, you have to be really careful about making sure that, that barrel made you the flavor that you want. So with Jack, we use about 150 barrels and we marry them all together and we bottle it. And when you go to um, one of these great liquor stores in New Hampshire, you'll see a row, probably 30 bottles facing the public, right? Mark, about 30 bottles of Jack every time. And you know every single bottle is gonna look the same. And there's no additives. We don't add anything by law. We're not allowed to, nor would we ever. So that color is consistent because we have enough product to marry and bottle and make sure that color and that flavor are consistent. Now with the single barrels, we have our tasters pick out the barrels they think exemplify what they're looking for in a single barrel whiskey. And that is a real job, by the way, a taster at Jack Daniels. We have um, about 70, depending on the scene, but on average about 70 tasters. And they go around our barrel house and taste whiskeys from all over the, the shelves and all over the different floors to make sure that what we're making is what we want to be making. But when it comes to single barrel, because each barrel lives on its own, they have to make sure that every single single barrel is the kind of barrel we want to put out there. And it's not that any of them are bad, better, good. There's really at that point, our distillers say, once you make the whiskey off the still, if it tastes good off the still, 
and you put it in a barrel, it's never going to get worse, but it has to live by itself. And Mark knows this because he buys a lot of these single barrels for the stores. So they're looking for certain types of flavor profiles. Maybe it's going to be a big vanilla sweet finish. Maybe they're looking for a big oaky palate. Maybe they want that mid, but they want to try to find that. And we have nine master tasters, including Chris Fletcher, um, who the last time you met him was probably the assistant master distiller. He's now the master distiller, Jack Daniels. Congratulations. Uh, Lynn Tolly, Jack's great grandniece, is one of our master tasters. And we have seven others. And someone's tasting one of these barrels that go out in the world. So besides coming from a barrel by itself, what does that really mean? So we make these barrels. The barrel really imparts so much of the flavor that it's so important to us that we actually have two cooperages that make every single barrel that Jack Daniels uh, ages in. And, you know, we buy trees with bark on them, these giant oak trees, test them for density. If they're the right kind of tree, we make a barrel. Now, even though we're buying new white oak, even though we're cutting them in the same building and we're putting them together in the same building, we're filling them in the same building, trees are nature, right? Mother nature made these trees. So this tree grew up here, that tree grew up there. They'd become barrels, one barrel is on the top floor next to the east wall, one barrel is on the sixth floor next to the west wall. So they're gonna age a little bit differently in these barrel houses. And because of that, the flavor in each barrel is gonna be slightly different. Now, you know, if, if I went to one of your houses for a Christmas dinner and you open a bottle of single barrel and four months later you come to my house and I have a different bottle, I don't know that I'm gonna to notice too much of the difference. However, when you side by side a couple of different barrels, you will notice extreme differences because some will have that big, bold, oaky finish. Some will be super caramel on the front nose and front palate. And that's what makes it fun. Um, another big difference is the proof. That's 94 proof where old number seven and gentleman Jack are 80. So what does that mean to flavor? So when we put our whiskey in the barrel, it's always at 125. So during maturation and evaporation of that process, the proof goes up because the water comes out. So at 94 proof, there's less water in that whiskey. And when there's less water, there's more alcohol, there's more viscosity, there's a creamier mouthfeel. And you're, you're also going to notice flavor differently. And single barrel is aged on average about two years longer than old number seven. I say on average because they're pulled when they're ready. We don't really know exactly when they're going to come out. So for all those reasons, these unique flavors and the way it plays in your palate and your mouth are going to be a little bit different. And to really uh, make an example of that, let's try it. Um, so I toast everyone on this call that may you be as awesome as your dog thinks you are. Cheers. Me too. Well, you're um, tasting this 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 one. We do have a couple questions online that I want to throw your way. So yes, one gentleman was asking, is there a similarity between Gentleman Jack and the old green label Jack Daniels? Yes, ish. So, um, so green label Jack, we're going to jump a little bit. Jack Daniels for about 20 years, we'll find out why soon, it was so hard to come by. It was on allocation. And at the time, you know, they wanted to put out Jack Daniels and get it back on the shelves because they were worried people were going to forget about Jack Daniels. So they decided to start pulling it younger, about two years. And then they were worried that people were, are going to feel like it tastes different. So um, they put it in a green label to say, hey, it's Jack Daniels, but it's not quite what you're used to. It's a little bit lighter. And as Jack finally caught up supply and demand and black label was back on the market in, in full force, green label wasn't needed as much. Over the time, um, you know, it was always a little bit less expensive because it aged less time. And when it ages less, we lose less. So there's more whiskey. And at the also at the time, Jack was 90, green was 80. So a little bit less expensive to make. Nowadays, I would say green label, similar Gemma Jack in, in, in one way, which is we're looking for some of these barrels that are a little bit lighter in flavor because Gentleman Jack is supposed to be a little bit more approachable, which is what the double mellowing does. But we're also going to start out with barrels that are coming from the low to mid floors. And if you think about heat rising, our barrel floors are seven, seven tall. So the single barrel mostly comes from those top floors where the heat in the summer can be 25 to 30 degrees warmer than the ground floor. That barrel expands more. It's picking up more of the oak, more of the vanillas, more, 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 more. Whereas 
Green Label and Gentleman Jack are coming from the lower floors where they don't expand quite as much, where we're not looking for as big of a flavor. So that would be the one big um, similarity. It's not double mellowed like Gentleman Jack. And also some of the Green Label, we might not be as panicked if the color of those barrels wasn't perfect because it, it, it is a brand that now it's kept in certain markets that really love it. And a couple of those markets are military markets. And we kind of feel like if we can get Jack Daniels to our military partners, a little bit less expensive, then we can suffer a little bit of the color. You know, for me, honestly, now that it's not aged two years, it's, you know, again, I, I've had green and black label side by side and a little bit lighter. But if you serve it to me at, at Thanksgiving dinner, I might not pick it, you know, wait a minute. That's not black label. Whereas at a two-year whiskey, I think everyone would kind of know the difference. Uh, I hope that answers answers that question. Great answer. And, and as you go through tonight's tasting, one of the other questions from someone who has joined us probably for 89 of the 90 nights, um, nice. Tracy would like to know, what's the best way to clean your palate between tastings? Very good question. Um, water to me is always a great way to do it. You know, any anything that's like, nuts or a cracker as long as it's not too salty you know something that's not going to shock your palate something that's going to maybe absorb like a cracker is great but it makes sure it's a very plain cracker water for me is fine um if i'm really this isn't my first time drinking jack so i'm not too concerned for myself but if you do want to know for you i would say water or a very mild like saltine cracker or something like that that's maybe a low salt cracker that just is going to absorb some of that off your palate and let you go. And then I would all, if you're going to eat something, I would have a sip of water after you eat something. Okay, um, you. So that would be my, uh, my best way. Now, you know, gentlemen, Jack, single barrel, we covered a little ground. There is a rumor that we're going to give away some gift certificates. So I kind of feel like this is a perfect time to give away number one. And uh, I believe if I'm right. It's 50 bucks in the store. You can use yeah. it for, whatever Jack product you want. And if you try to sneak around, you know, a bottle of wine or something, there's, there's going to be something to pay. Um, <laughs> exactly. you, see, you see Mark, right? You don't want any part of that. Um, but no, $50 gift certificate, use it as you want and try whatever you want. Enjoy yourself. So my first question, and since I answered this already, it's going to go to this, the old number seven answer. So whoever answers this seventh is going to be the winner. So James, I hate to make you have to count real quick, but what is the only production difference between bourbon and Tennessee whiskey? What is the only production difference between bourbon and Tennessee whiskey? We will be monitoring. We will grab the seventh winner from Facebook or All right. Zoom. Our, All right. Well, we have, there's, we got a lot. We definitely have over seven here. So uh, charcoal mellowing, filtering, charcoal filtering, all sugar maple char. Yes, 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 yes. So, Good listeners, um, make my mom proud that you paid attention to me. So thank you. Awesome. We will have three more questions and three more prizes coming up. Now I say we've done uh, Gentleman Jack, our approachable, our softest, our, our answer to we want, we want to have whis whiskey kiss our palate, not shock our palate. Then we've gone all the way to the other side of the spectrum with uh, single barrel, bigger, bolder, more flavor, more proof. And now I say we go to the brand that started it all, old number seven, Jack Daniels, uh, the brand that that Jack, you know, hung his hat on and we still do to this day. You know, the whiskey I discovered whiskey on and still love and Sinatra's whiskey and rock and roll's whiskey and country music's whiskey. Let's do it. So what's the big difference now? Like, First of all, people always ask me, why do we have all these different expressions of Jack Daniels? If I say Jack is so great, why would we make all these different flavor profiles? And the reason is we're, not, we're all like snowflakes, right? We're all built a little bit differently. So some of us are looking for big, bold, some approachable, some right down the middle, some want high, high, you know, barrel strength, some want rye, or we might all want all of it, right? Maybe one night I'm a single barrel guy on the rocks. Another night I'm a you know, Jack Neat guy, another, maybe I'm a gentleman Jack Sour. And maybe one night I just want one snifter, a big cube of fireplace and some barrel proof. So we make it all. And that way, whatever you're in the mood for, it's there for you. 
but day in day out this is the whiskey i i reach for and old number seven 10 feet of charcoal, just like Gentleman Jack, does not go through a second charcoal no less than four years, probably on average about five. And it's really made as close as we possibly can come to, to how Jack used to make it himself. None of our processes really evolved too much. We have a few things that are, that are pretty high tech, like how we weigh our grains and how we weigh things like that are much more we can probably get to the point oh, 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 of something where Jack would be like, yeah, it looks about right. <laughs> we'll take that. Um, but, you know, the, one of the bigger things that we do different than Jack did is our how we heat our stills. Jack used fire. We use steam. And trust me, I bet Jack wished steam was more available back then because it's a much more consistent way to heat those stills. Um, still 100% copper stills, just like that. We even, took like Jack did, um, even the plates inside of our stills are 100% copper. So our whiskey touches nothing but copper, which is really important for the whiskey making process. Our yeast that we use, um, without getting too much science, if you ever made sourdough bread, you know how they do that is they pull some of the first batch out, put into the second batch, and that keeps that yeast going throughout the, the sour mashing process. And that's how we do it with our whiskey. When we use those giant uh, fermenter tanks, after every batch is distilled, we take about 30% of those uh, spent grains and put them into the next batch. So there's a little bit of that yeast consistent in every batch of Jack Daniels. And we can legally say that goes back to prohibition. We've been using the same yeast strain since prohibition. I would guess it's the same strain Jack used. We just have no proof of that. His nephew was making whiskey after prohibition. I can't imagine he abandoned his, his uncle's uh, tried and true, but there's no letter that says still using Uncle Jack's yeast. So we say prohibition. Uh, so it's all the same. And we've been doing it like this forever. Jack is meant to be balanced. Okay. Where Gentleman Jack comes in smooth, does a little bit of dance in the middle of your palate, and then leaves that, that gentleman's exit. That's that, that style. Single barrel comes in with big flavors of vanilla, big caramel notes, and then ends with a nice oak at the back of your throat. And Jack Daniels is meant to be a balance of all of that. We pull barrels from all over the barrel house, you know, high, low, middle. And we're looking for it to really live in the mid palate. You get the sweet Jack nose on the tip of your tongue. It coats your mouth. You, you get all that flavor. And then you have a little bit of that oak on the finish. And Jack really is meant to be, like we used to say in our ad, smooth sipping whiskey. And I, I really, that's what I do. You know, I used to, if you asked me nine months ago, I was Jack Rocks everywhere I went. And since COVID, for some reason, maybe because my ice is so terrible in my freezer, I've just been drinking Jack Neat. And it really is. I hate to quote one of our ads from the 50s, but it really is smooth sip in Tennessee whiskey. So um, cheers to you. And speaking of 2020, uh, may the best of your past be the worst of your future. Cheers. You too, well, you, well, you flavor that one. Um, I do want to let people know that um, during our 90 days events that we're doing, we have uh, the month of December, we'll end off with some of our spirits. And then obviously in January, we'll be replacing some of those with one angel spirit. They do replace the two big events we do each year, which is the distiller showcase where you and some of your cohorts have been able to come out to New Hampshire and interact with our consumers. And in January, we have the winter wine spectacular where we have the same um, type of celebrity appearances for the wine side of the house. And so unfortunately, we didn't get to do that this year, but that's why we have the 90 days. As part of that entertainment, we um, if you visit 90daysaroundtheworld.com, and that's the number 90, 90daysaroundtheworld.com, you can actually see all of these events, uh, sign up through event right there. And you can also download an app that we're using called Scavify, which is S-C-A-V-I-F-Y, Scavify. And it's like a scavenger hunt um, where you can earn points as a passport for going to all these 90-day uh, events. And obviously adds up to savings and just good fun. So we hope people get, get a chance to do that because we know you're trapped indoors a little bit right now. So at least keeps it a little bit more entertaining, gets you some savings off of those spirits and wines that you might buy. And how is that flavor, UT? You know, it tastes like Jack Daniels. Um, they, they're, just, they're still doing it right. You know, again, you get like, I like a little bit of that sweet note of Jack. Also in cocktails, I really enjoy using Jack because um, there is a subtle, and if we were again live, I would try to 
uh, coax this out of you, but since we're not, there is a subtle banana note in Jack Daniels. And Chris, our master distiller, really thinks it comes from the yeast strain. And because of the way we charcoal mellow and remove some other flavors, it kind of allows it to shine. So Jack Daniels, while it's great to sip on its own on the rocks, Jack and Coke, all that good stuff, some of the unique flavors of Jack really do work well in interesting cocktails. So Tiki is the one that I think is the most surprising for people when I make Jack Tiki cocktails, which is a couple of reasons. One is that banana note. I feel like it really works well with a lot of the tropical cocktails. Another thing is, and if you were a rum bar, I would never suggest you remove all your rum cocktails and only use Jack Daniels, but it is a fun way to, to play around. So, you know, when you think about American whiskey, we use that barrel one time by law. Once Jack is fully matured in our barrels, they got to go. And because sustainability is so important to us, we usually resell them to other distilleries where a used barrel is A-OK. Um, and some of those distillers are rum producers. So a lot of aged rums are aged in Jack barrels. So they're also pulling some of those same flavors that Jack pulls. So, and rum tends to be a little, little bit sweeter. So I feel like putting a whiskey in a tiki cocktail that already has some of a similar flavor profile, it's fun. Like my Mai Tai I call black tie, get it? You know, see what I did there? Um, you know, so it's just kind of fun to, to put Jack in some of these different tiki cocktails. And also you're, you know, I think guests when they go out to a bar would be like, Jack Daniels and a tiki cocktail and it just starts a conversation. The, um, so those flavors I love to play around with. And I even think Jack and Coke, I think there's a reason uh, Jack and Coke has, I think the first mention of it was like 1907. So the fact that it's still around and still such probably the most called for brand name cocktail there is, I think the margarita is the number one cocktail, but there's no brand associated with a margarita. Jack and Coke is the most called for branded drink out there. And I think the reason it works, you know, we don't know the secret recipe of Coca-Cola, but I do know it contains vanilla and it contains some of the parallel flavors that are in Jack, which I feel like that's why they kind of go together. Um, so that's what I taste when I, when I taste Jack. I taste a lot of those sweet notes, a little bit of oak in the back. And then that mid palate is kind of where it just lives. Jack lives in that mid palate of balance. It's stretched between oak and sweet and just living there. Um, and someone asked me my favorite child, my favorite bottle of Jack. I guess, you know, it's, it's tough to say my favorite, but if I go to the kid I play most with, it'd be Jack, old number seven. You know, every once in a while, if I'm going to have one drink, sometimes it'll be a single barrel or Sinatra, something I'm going to really sip on that's higher proof that if I'm out and about, especially if I'm out with Mark, I know I'm not having one drink. So I'd rather stick to something in around the 80, 86 proof range um, versus 94 and above. So, but yeah, I, they're all good for different occasions, but my everyday go-to is um, old number seven. Now, since most people can't pick their favorite uh, children, I will say this. Someone mentioned my Led Zeppelin poster behind me. Both Robert Plant and Jimmy Page have picked their favorite child and it's the song Cashmere. So that's their favorite kid. In case you're curious, a little side divergent for you. Um, now, you know, Jack was not always the giant brand it is today. And a lot of that happened after Prohibition, where it started turning the corner from becoming a very popular, successful local brand into what we know today as an international icon. And this all happened around you know, the 1950s. So at that point, I think Jack was distributed in about 13 or 14 um, states all in, you know, Southeast region. And something happened, which is Frank Sinatra. And Frank Sinatra discovered Jack Daniels and fell in love. And if any of you own a bottle of Sinatra Select or have heard me or any one of our uh, Brown Foreman, Jack Daniels allies tell this story, you've all heard a tale of Jackie Gleason introducing Jack Daniels to Frank Sinatra. And myself, Chris Fletcher, the master stiller, our historian Nelson Eddy, and Charlie Pignon, the president of Frank Sinatra Enterprises, all would have told you that story six months ago. And then it changed. Um, so I am not 100% sure, and, and Charlie wasn't super clear either, where the 
Jackie Gleason story started, we do know they were friends and we do know they both drank Jack Daniels and maybe they drank it together and maybe that's all we knew. So that's the story we kind of molded into or that was told down the generations to where we had it. Turns out, not true. Uh, Jackie Gleason did not introduce uh, Jack Daniels to Frank. So in the early 1950s, Sinatra, this is probably the only period of his seven decade career where he wasn't on top of the world. He was having some trouble with his wife, ex-wife, Ava Gardner, and he wasn't getting the movie offers. He lost his record deal. And he was kind of on a low point. So much as we all, and especially I know me personally, love Sinatra, look up to Sinatra. He also loved and looked up to people. And one of those people was Humphrey Bogart. And in 1982, uh, the Charlie from the Sinatra Enterprises, uh, he recently listened to a concert from 82 at Caesars Palace in Las Vegas. Sinatra's on stage singing. And at some point he looks out to his audience, holds up his glass of Jack Daniels and says, did I ever tell you the story about how I discovered Jack Daniels? And Charlie, I'm sure was expecting to hear the Jackie Gleason story. And he says, I was at a dinner party at my good friend Humphrey Bogart's house. And after dinner, he came up to me and said, what would you like for an after dinner drink? And Sinatra's like, I don't care. I'll drink anything. And Bogey said, well, if you're going to drink anything and drink what I want, and that's Jack Daniels. So Frank says, what the hell is Jack Daniels? And Bogey says, I'm going to show you and gave him a glass. And from that day forward, Frank Sinatra was in love with Jack Daniels. And about two years later, he went on stage and held up his glass of Jack Daniels on the rocks, dash of water. That's how he drank it and said to the audience, this is Jack Daniels, it's the nectar of the gods. And the very next year, sales at Jack Daniels doubled. Um, there was also two articles that came out, but you know, Sinatra, I think, had a very, very big influence over the world. And he said he loved Jack Daniels, and now people wanted to try it. And that's what started that trajectory of Jack being a small localized brand to this international phenomenon. So for the next, by the end of the 50s, and for the next 20 years, Jack was on allocation, meaning you probably couldn't find it, which is crazy when you think about it now, but it's very true. And there's a great story and, and it's very relevant right now because our very first sales guy uh, was a, a guy named Angelo Lucchese. First non-nephew that sold Jack Daniels. He was hired to be our first salesman. And in the late sixties, he was going to mass on a Sunday and his buddy that drove in the mass every week had some friends in New York. So when he picked up Angelo, he said, Angelo, I got to tell you something. I got a call from a friend in New York and Sinatra's pissed off. And Angelo's like, why? And he's like, they was at the Copacabana club last night and they didn't have any Jack Daniels and old fashioned term raising sand. He said Sinatra was raising sand. And the guy that called Angelo's friend was Jilly Rizzo. Now, for those of you that know, Jilly Rizzo was Sinatra's very, very close friend owned a restaurant in New York called Jilly's and he was Sinatra's right-hand guy for definitely 25 to 30 years before he passed. So Jilly says to the mutual friend, there's got to be a good Italian down there that's got some clout that can get Frank some Jack Daniels. So Angela's like, I'm Italian, but I don't know if I have any clout. So the next morning, Monday morning, went into the Jack offices and said to Jack's great nephew, Hat Motlow, hey, Frank Sinatra uh, was pissed off, couldn't find any Jack in New York can we do something for him? And Hat Motlow was like, he's like, man, it's really tough to come by right now. We're really, you know, strapped. He's like, I don't know if I could do it. So he's like, why don't you go talk to the president? So he goes to talk to the president, Jack Daniels, tells him the story. And the president says to Angelo, I'm a huge fan of Sinatra. I'll make something happen for you. So he got a case of Jack to Frank with a note from Angelo. And a couple of days later, Angelo's phone rings, his wife picks up and she's like, uh-huh, uh-huh. You got to take this and hands the phone to Angelo and it was Sinatra. And he called Angelo and said, hey, he goes, what you did for me, I'll never forget. He goes, you just made a friend for life. He goes, take this phone number down. And Sinatra gave Angelo his phone number. And that started a friendship that lasted from the late 60s until the day Frank was laid rest and Angelo was at that funeral. And uh, ironically enough, Sinatra had a bottle of Jack put in the casket with him to make sure that wherever he was going, they'll have Jack Daniels. So Angelo would be 100 this month, which is why I really wanted to talk to him and, and toast Angelo Lucchese. Um, died a few years ago, but he was a true and true, probably one of the most important 
people in the Jack Daniels uh, chain of where we were to where we got to. Angelo is a great guy. Um, so that's really, and that was the only connection Frank had to our distillery. It was not a corporate thing where we paid this guy to run around and say, Jack's the best. He just loved it. And his son and Angelo, were, there's a video on YouTube, it's great, where they're talking about Frank and his love for Jack Daniels. And they both agreed that if we tried to, you know, power play Frank into loving Jack more, he probably would have disowned it because he kind of felt like he discovered it. And in a way, it was such a small brand, he kind of did. So, you know, thanks to Frank, thanks to Angelo. And when Frank was about to be 100, we worked with the Sinatra State and his three kids at the time on a project which became Sinatra. We really thought it was important to honor that friendship between Sinatra and his whiskey of choice. So yes, it's a fancy bottle. Yes, it comes in a nice box with a little booklet, which now has a fake story about how we discovered it, um, collector's item. But it's not just a fancy bottle. We also uh, did something a little bit unique to the whiskey. And again, because we make our barrels, we have a lot of flexibility over how we do anything with that wood. And our distillers and our coopers felt like that might be the answer to making something special for Frank. So this is the inside of a Sinatra barrel stave. So this part here where it's all charred, that's what every new charred oak American barrel looks like. The entire inside of the barrel looks like that. The Sinatra barrel, once we toast and once we char it, uh, they built a machine that was in the barrel and cuts grooves all the way around the barrel up, up, up. And what that does, because it cuts about a quarter inch in a, not sure you can see that. Um, it doubles the surface area, the whiskey touches inside the barrel. Also, it touches new oak as soon as it gets inside the barrel, charred oak and new oak immediately. Typically, it would be summertime when that wood would expand and the whiskey would get deeper into the wood past the char. In a Sinatra barrel, it starts on both new oak and charred oak. And that's going to give you so much flavor right off the bat. So the whiskey matures its full lifespan in that Sinatra barrel. And when it's finished, there's so much oak and so much flavor, our distillers felt like they needed to balance that. So they picked some hand select barrels of old number seven that had more of that vanilla caramel finish, married them together and bottled it Sinatra select. So that's really to me, what, what makes this so special and un unique is, is how it's done. It's also 90 proof, which is a little bump up from old number seven. And the goal is to, to really stretch in two ways those unique flavors, that bold oak character, a little bit of spice, and then those sweet notes. So if anyone and everyone has a little bit of Sinatra select in front of them, let's do a little toast to Frank. Um, and in the words of Frank Sinatra, a ring-a-ding-ding. -ding. Cheers. E.T., I think you mentioned to me in an earlier call something about one of the songs for Frank Sinatra too coming true. Yeah, so thanks for reminding me. The, uh, so this year, it's like the ordinary talk people celebrating their, their would-be birthdays, but this would be Frank's 105th birthday, uh, December 12th. So his song young at heart which was a favorite of my father's there's a line in that song that says something like and if you should survive to 105 think of all you derive out of being alive and you'd get a head start um if you were a little bit young at heart so this would be sinatra's 105th birthday and i think he survived through his music and through his style and through all the things he gave the world you know depending on who you ask, Sinatra was the greatest, most generous, loving human being in the world. On the flip side, if you cross Frank Sinatra, he didn't take too kindly to that. And although Jack and Frank never met, I do think they had one really core character value in common. And that was their, their love of helping other people and, and helping the little guy and being generous. And I think in this time right now, you know, we're on this call having fun, drinking some whiskey. And I'm sure, like myself, everyone here has been through some stuff this year. I don't think anyone escaped 2020 unscathed. But we are having a good time right now. And, and I'm sure we all know someone that 
might be a little bit less fortunate than us. And, and in the vein of Sinatra and Jack, you know, let's see if we can share a little bit of that love. I mean, Jack, he was successful. You know, when he was alive, he did well. Remember, it's a town of 300 people. So if you're the guy that owns the, the distillery, you're doing well. But he did well, well. Like he had a nice house and he threw all the parties. But if you were having a bad year, if your farm didn't do the things you needed to do or something happened or something broke down, you went to Uncle Jack and typically Uncle Jack would write you a check or give you some money or help you out of a jam, knowing full well he was never going to get paid back. He just took care of his friends and neighbors and people he loved. And Sinatra was no different. He is famous for, there's a great book called Me and Mr. S about Sinatra and a guy that worked him for 15, 20 years during the Palm Springs years. And he said Frank would read the paper every morning. And if he read a horror story, like woman's husband passed away, she's got six kids, they're about to foreclose on her house. He would send a check for 10 grand. It would not be coming from Frank Sinatra, be coming from a company that didn't say his name on it. He would never let them say it came from Frank. And he would just take care because he wanted to help people. He knew that he got all the things in life and he wanted other people to feel not horrible every time something bad happened. And one of my favorite Sinatra stories is there was an actor named Lee J. Cobb. I'm dating myself a little bit, but if you saw 12 Angry Men or On the Waterfront, he was the heavy, the bad guy, the, the, the tough guy. And him and Sinatra did a movie in the 40s together. And I don't think they really crossed paths much, but they met. And about 15 years later, Lee J. Cobb had a heart attack. After the heart attack, he was in the hospital. Two nurses show up and said they were there on behalf of Mr. Frank Sinatra. He heard he had taken ill and wanted to make sure that his recovery was as smooth as possible. He actually got him a place to live and round the clock care on Frank's dime for a guy he barely knew and just loved his talent. And that's the kind of guy Sinatra was. And, I, and that's the kind of guy Jack was. And I feel like we all have a little bit of that in us and it's the season and it's the year. And if we're ever going to, share some of that, this is the year. So to all of us and to all the people in our lives that need us, cheers. It sounds like a, a good time to do another giveaway. What do you think, E.T.? I think it's a perfect time for a giveaway. So I can check my box today of doing something nice. So another question, we'll go with a uh, seventh answer again. The who taught Jack Daniels, how to make whiskey. Who taught Jack Daniels how to make whiskey? People are definitely paying attention. They are answering. Yeah. While uh, James told us who the winner is for that one, um, we did post that the, the last winner was David H. So we did post that on the, on the stream. Awesome. And we'll get in touch with you. Um, Mark, I know you've been answering some questions about what's in the store and pricing, but I thought it might be interesting for you to comment on how you choose your single barrels as well, because I've, I've seen you in the works and I've seen you try to think of all the types of consumers we have and, and how to kind of have a range for them. So would you like to share some thoughts on that? Sure, absolutely. Um, yeah, it's, uh, you know, some people is a great opportunity. I've had the uh, opportunity to go down to Jack Daniels. I think I've been down there at least four, four or five times. Um, the distillery tour is great. Uh, you learn something new every time. You see something different. Um, one of the times I've been down there, I've been able to see them uh, burn the charcoal for the charcoal mellowing. So it's, it's a great opportunity if you can get down there and visit them down in Lynchburg. But um, yeah, it's a it's a unique process. Um, you, you go down, and, and I've been lucky enough to sit with uh, Jeff Arnett, the former master distiller, and Chris Fletcher, who is now the master distiller. Congratulations, Chris. Well deserved. Um, Basically, they go through the uh, through the multiple rick houses and they pick out some select barrels. And um, you know, to give you an example, the last time we were down there, we picked um, 18 barrels in 2018. Um, so we sampled through about 36 different samples, um, which is a lot. Um, as as ET mentioned, there's a lot of water, a lot of crackers. Uh, a lot of talking in between. Um, so basically we go through and, and we, when you're picking a wide range of barrels like that, it's actually easier um, because if I'm picking one barrel out, I'm not going to lie to you, I'll be selfish. I kind of look at something that I like. I like a well-rounded, you know, sweeter up front, brings in the spice in the middle and finishes with a little bit of heat on the end. I like a nice long finish so you know that you're drinking something on the, you know, whether you like it on the rocks or straight. 
But when you're drink, when you're when you're selecting that many barrels, I kind of look for a wide range, like ET mentioned earlier. You know, if we're picking 18 barrels, I'll try to pick three or four that are kind of entry level, a little bit a little bit sweeter, a little bit um, easier drinking for somebody that's new to the whiskey category. Then I'll look for three to four that kind of hit that mid range that I like and kind of have all the flavors mixed throughout. And then I'll try to pick four or five that are big, bold, spicy that, you know, would pair well with a cigar, uh, would go well with an after dinner drink by the fireplace. And then the other three or four that are mixed in there, you're just going to find something that's really unique. You know, like ET said earlier, you get one that, you know, a lot of times I don't get a lot of banana out of it, but you get one that just the banana jumps out at you. Or you get one that really is really maple. You really get that maple or really that sugar forward, that kind of unique, almost cotton candy style. So ones that are really kind of off the chart unique, we really look for. But then we try to hit um, all the palates of all the customers that we think that will be coming into our locations. And, and that way, we hope you come into the stores and you buy one. We have tasting notes that we post right in the stores. 99% um, of those are my personal tasting notes. So everybody's palate's different, but I try to give you an idea of what I got out of the whiskey. So if you buy a, a entry level one and you buy a bold one and, and sample them together, you can really pick out the different flavors in there. So it's, it's a great process. It's usually about half a day. Um, believe it or not, your face hurts a little bit at the end, but uh, it's well worth it. And we hope our consumers really enjoy our selections out there. There's a lot of them out there. Thanks, Mark. I appreciate you sharing awesome. that. It's interesting for our consumers to think that there's one person that's doing all this tasting and, and that you can follow them throughout the different bottles that you try if, if you just keep experimenting, like like ET mentioned earlier. Sorry, ET, go ahead. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, I was just going to say, it's really cool that you that because you buy so many barrels, someone could conceivably stock up on three or four and then when their friends come over, have a tasting of their own because when you do go side by side, that's when you really see all those unique differences. Um, someone asked about how many bottles come out of a single barrel on average about 240. So, you know, the, you get about 200, Mark, you probably know because you do it every year, but on average about 240 bottles. So even we've had consumers buy them as like a group of friends also will go down and buy a barrel, like 10 friends will go down and pick a barrel and all get, you know, 24 bottles. So it's a fun way. And I've seen bachelors do it for their, their groom's gifts. They'll buy a whole barrel. I mean, I think my guy's got nail clippers, but it'd be nice if I could buy a barrel Jack Daniels. The, um, but yeah, it's, it's really fun. It's the whole experience is really fun to be with one of our master tasters choosing that barrel. And, and really like Mark said, if it's your barrel, if you're going to get one, then typically it's the one you love the most. I went down with my old boss at, at a bar I used to run and we picked out a barrel and it was cool. And we, we, we went for the unique one that we've never tasted before because we're like, you know, typically they all do fall into profiles and every once in a while there's that one super banana cotton candy or some type of flavor that you're not going to get every single time. So it was kind of fun to do that. The, someone also asked about if you're getting an ugly sweater, like uh, Mark is wearing. So three of the gifts that we're giving away are the $50 gift certificate. You can buy whatever you want with that. And if they're selling an ugly sweater in the store, which I don't think they are, you could buy that. The fourth gift, however, is going to be a mystery care package for me for some of my uh, swag that I've collected over the years. I, if you win, I will look for the ugly sweater for you if I have one. And I think we just go back to back. Let's go another question because I feel like people want to win this right now. So another uh, answer that's been given. So get your typing fingers ready. I'm going to let you hover over your keyboards before I answer the question, ask the question. What gives Jack Daniels over 50% of its flavor and 100% of its color? What gives Jack Daniels, wow, they're coming in already. <laughs> yes, it was the barrel. Um, yeah, so charcoal, even though charcoal is burned wood down to 99 point something percent pure carbon, zero color comes off the charcoal and zero flavor is added from that charcoal. It all comes from the barrel. Um, depending on what distiller of what American age whiskey, I've heard people say 70% comes from the barrel, 50%, 60%. And that, you know, if, let's pretend you're a, a steakhouse, fancy steakhouse. Steak is the number one ingredient on the plate. So you know where that meat came from. And that's why we make those barrels because that is basically our steak. That's the number one ingredient 
that flavors our whiskey. And we don't want to risk that control at all. The, so the trees come in on, on giant 18 wheeler flatbeds and they're oak trees fully um, still barked. And it, we have five stave mills and that's the, the staves of the individual pieces of wood that make up a barrel. So we have five stave mills and in every one of these stave mills, there's a, a guy or gal that tests the quality of the trees that come in to make sure it's a jack barrel. And in one of them, uh, this guy, Zach, is the quality control. And he tested and he said, when it's not quite dense enough, there's a paper mill down the road that also is getting oak. So they'll save the dense ones for him because they don't need that to make paper and they'll swap them out. But every, every single log is tested. And then these giant logs go through a machine that takes the bark off. And now it's this, um, you know, 30, 40, 50 foot log and there's a crane type machine with an eight foot saw blade that comes towards the crane as the person pulls the lever and cuts pieces of this. If there's any impurities in the wood, they cut that out. And the first time I went to the stave mill, the person in the cab was a woman. And I'm like, wow, I would never do that job. I'm crazy that she's in there. And like, yeah, no men do that job. It's all women because men are too scared. And he's like, for some reason, all the women are like, yeah, I'll get up in there. And all the men are like, uh-uh. And, you know, once again, we're reminded that, you know, smarter, stronger, everything, you know, and it's just proven in your face in a whiskey county making barrels, which you feel like that's what men do. Here's a woman doing a job that I would never, ever do because I'm too scared. Um, and at our Cooper just too, it's, it's men and women. It's, it's really cool to watch. And when they make the barrels, the, I don't know if I gave you, Sean, a picture of the, the, barrel being raised, but it's about 31 of these pieces of wood long and you have to pick the right ones and put them together and, and make that barrel. And everyone that works at the cooperage, no matter what you're ultimately gonna be when you grow up at the cooperage, everyone starts working at least a week or two on the, just so you know what it's like to raise a barrel. So when you go on the tour, you, they have a little counter and you can see who's done what and everyone's if you get there towards the end of the day, it's about 200 barrels a day. So someone's at 190, the girl over there is at 212, this guy's at 225, someone's at 189. And then there's always one person at like 40 barrels and they're sweating because they're not meant to be there for life. That's just, they're getting their hands dirty and trying to see what it's like to make a barrel. So it's, it's always funny. And then we get to make them and you know how hard it really is. So pretty, pretty fun. Um, has any other questions come in just yet? that you know yeah, we have of. a couple more questions from you um they're actually around the the barrel so they they are curious how long a barrel lasts for but i think they're talking about purchasing a barrel and, and probably it'd be good to explain the bottling of that and then we also have one um how long do you typically age in a single barrel for the single barrel got you uh, so as i mentioned it's 240 bottles to a barrel um when we when you buy your own barrel we don't sell you the actual but you can take the barrel, but you don't get a barrel of whiskey. We have to bottle it for you by law. So you pick out your barrel, we bottle it. We send you all the bottles in the barrel head with your name engraved on it. Super fun. Now, in terms of how long a barrel lasts, very good question. You know, Jack, as big as Jack is, the distillery has a less than 1% carbon footprint on the world because our motto is recycle, reuse, repurpose. Anything that we can do to lengthen the life of any of our ingredients or processes we try to do. Our cooperages and stave mills are zero waste facil uh, facilities. So that's something they're really proud of. Now how, now you say to yourself, well, if you're only aging Jack for five, seven, eight, nine years, I feel like an oak tree takes longer to grow than that. Very true. But we then, there's a whole secondary market for these barrels and the, the bulk of it, probably 90% of that secondary market is other distilleries. So while bourbon and Tennessee whiskey by law have to age in new charred white American barrels, Scotch, Irish, Canadian, rum, tequila can all use used barrels. And that's not to say one's better or worse than the other. It's just different styles of alcohol. So they require different needs. And if you think about Scotch, we we're talking before and I was joking about in the eighties, you know, Scotch was the, the, the whiskey everyone revered for its, um, it was, you know, the most well-made whiskey on the planet. I, I think a lot of it had to do with numbers. 
right? So you look at scotch, you're like 35-year-old scotch, 25-year-old scotch, oh, seven-year-old bourbon. I would rather, I need to have the, the big number. And again, not better or worse. We, we own a few scotch brands. I have nothing against scotch. So I'm just trying to compare why that is. So if you think about the South where, you know, while you can make bourbon in any state in America, as long as you follow the rules, 90 plus percent is made in Kentucky. All of Tennessee is made in Tennessee. And both of those places get super hot in the summer and very, very humid. And so the play that the alcohol gets in this new barrel is, is wild. The in and out of the wood is really uh, effective for getting flavor. Also think about it, it's a new barrel. And think about a tea bag. So if you make yourself a cup of, of Earl Grey tea in the morning and you're like, oh, I'm still tired. I was out with Mark last night. I need to wake up. And you want a second cup of tea and you forgot to go to Trader Joe's and get yourself another box of tea. You take that used tea bag in a new cup of water. It's not as flavorful that second time around. You're not getting as much of that flavor from the used tea bag. So a used barrel is very similar. When you recharge it, age a different spirit, you're not getting those big, bold oak and vanilla and caramel flavors because when you char that barrel the first time, what it's doing, it's caramelizing the natural sugar in the wood. That's why when you hear us talk about caramels and vanillas and this note and that note, none of that's in any whiskey. I mean, flavored whiskey, yes, but no traditional bourbon or Tennessee can put any of that in there. But the sugars are being caramelized just like a marshmallow. You know, if you eat a plain marshmallow, it's okay. It's sweet, but it doesn't have a lot of flavor. But you put it in fire, and all of a sudden, you have all these notes that weren't in that plain marshmallow. That's a barrel. But the second time and the third time you toast and char these barrels, less and less and less. When you see a 35-year-old Scott, you could not, I don't know, I don't think you could do a 35-year-old bourbon and it'd be delicious. You could do it, but it'd be so oaky. I think that's all you'd get is one big, giant oak note. But in Scotland or Ireland, you can do stuff like that because summer in scotland is not tennessee you know you're it's it's wet and it's cold and you're not getting those crazy temperatures so you're not getting all that play and you're also not using a new barrel so to get back to your question how long they last think about if a scotch distillery uses that barrel two or three times for a 25 year old scotch that's 75 more years that might not actually happen but every barrel that you use is outliving how long it takes to grow a tree so if it takes 40 to 50 years for us to get a tree, a barrel is going to outlive that. And we actually work with a couple forestry departments, the University of Tennessee and Kentucky to make sure that all of our partners that grow these trees have all the information, all the tools at their disposal to make sure that we're putting back into the earth more than we're taking out. So A, we can always have barrels, but also we're not destroying our planet by, by making whiskey. So yeah, barrels live a very, very long life. And then when they're really done, they become dog beds or they become a bar in your house. We put a cabin in there. They become a, take a stave and it's a, you know, like my house, it's a guitar rack where someone put a little guitar holders on it. So you can have a lot of fun there as well. Um, ET, we have a couple more things to do. So for our Scavify watchers who are trying to collect their points, we do have the code word for tonight. And the code word is number seven. Um, you don't need to worry about how to spell it and write it because it's a multiple choice answer on Scavify, but just know that it is number seven is the code word. Um, and then there's no other questions right now. Would you like to do our special yes. e, e package giveaway? Yeah. So think about this as an adult college care package. I'm going to stuff this box with lots of fun Jack Daniel stuff. If the seventh person can answer this question for me, who coined the phrase the Rat Pack? Who coined the phrase the Rat Pack? And my hint is it's not the obvious choice. I have a sneaky suspicion that when you're flipping through the channels on the weekend, if you see the Rat Pack actually doing their roasts and everything, you just get stuck on that channel, don't you? <laughs> yeah, I do. I actually, I get stuck on YouTube down some really dark, dark dives of the Rat Pack and Frank, Dean, and Sammy and everyone. It is pretty funny. Um, it's honest humor, that's I for sure. I've seen it come up a few times. I don't know if we've hit seven yet. So I'll, I'll give it a second. James can let us know. But Sinatra, his first house he owned in Palm Springs is called Twin Palms because you guessed it, there's two palm trees growing side by side. And 
Frank often would raise a flag on one of the, the trees and it was not the American flag, which Frank Sinatra was very proud of being American. It was not the Italian flag and Sinatra was very proud of his heritage. It was the Jack Daniels flag. And when his neighbors saw him raise the Jack Daniels flag on the palm tree, they knew it was cocktail time. And that's when they would all start migrating over to Frank's house for drinks. So good times at Frank's house in Palm Springs. So now I've definitely seen it more than people are guessing using the Google. Um, but I've, so I'm sure someone's got it. Lauren Bacall named, uh, came up with the phrase, the Rat Pack. She was married to Bogey, uh, right? You heard the song, just like Bogey and Bacall. And she came home one day and Bogey and some of his friends had been on a uh, night of drinking. They didn't look so good. And she walked into her house, the shades are closed, they're smoking cigars, they're drinking. And she'd scan the room and she goes, we look at this goddamn rat pack. And Bogey thought that was funny. So he started calling all his friends, including Sinatra, the rat pack. So the rat pack was actually Bogey's club first. And when he passed away, the torch passed to Sinatra. And that's really the rat pack that we know the most about. And interestingly enough, Sinatra almost married, Lauren Bacall and Sinatra almost got married after Bogey died. And I think it's just, they weren't men for each other. I think they really just loved Bogey and had that connection. And once that wore off, like, what are we doing? So they, they didn't get married. But in Lauren Bacall's book, she claimed that she drank more Jack Daniels than Frank Sinatra, which it's a big claim because I, I drank a lot of Jack Daniels. Um, so good job, Sylvia, on, on the the care package. Um, I hope I wow you with all the good stuff that's in there. And, you know, I, I just want to thank everyone again for all of your questions and being here and tasting this whiskey. I, I hope I answered everything. If there's anything else that you see come through, Sean, let me know. I'm happy to, um, you know, certainly will. It's, it's been a pleasure chatting with you, Etia. It's always interesting. Your, your passion for the Rat Pack and everything else always comes out, which is interesting. Um, we do have two more this week, so it's a you can finish your holiday week strong with us. We have two more Scotch whiskeys on Tuesday and Wednesday night, so Mark will be here as well as myself, and we can have fun with that. Um, I think we didn't announce the third gift card winner, so I just want to make sure it was uh, Daria. Let's see, Killabrew. So Daria, you were the winner of the third card. I don't think we announced it, but we wrote it in the window. So we'll certainly be in touch with all the winners. Um, any any last words for our group, Et? The, uh, yeah, look, I, anything like this goes without saying it is the holiday season and why most of us will probably be home. Enjoy the holiday responsibly. You know, I want you to enjoy the whole holiday season, not just one, one big night. And, and again, just really thank you for having me and thank you for all of us almost there, right? We only have like 10 days left to get through 2020 and let's just hope that we can turn a corner soon and we can get back on the path to, me being on planes and coming back out to the great state of New Hampshire. Cause I gotta be honest, you know, I fell in love with the place the last time I came to visit Mark and then all this stuff happened. I haven't been able to come back and it's been about people like you love it there. I'm like, I love it there. It's gorgeous. The people were so nice and took me to some fun places, ate some good food. So, and my, now my sister-in-law and brother-in-law live in New Hampshire. So that's the only negative. No kidding. Um, the, uh, but no, have a great holiday season be good to each other and enjoy yourselves. Thank you too. Have a great night. Have a great night, everybody. We'll uh, have thank this. You, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.